Hi, I'm Eamon Ambrose, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Damon Ambrose. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. I really appreciate you listening. If you go to hankgarner.com, you can go through all of the archives, more than 300 shows, author interviews with the very best people in publishing today. On the right-hand sidebar, there's places where you can subscribe uh, for just about every platform that you could possibly listen to the show on. Thank you to all of our sponsors for making the show possible. If you would like to sponsor the show, please go to HankGarner.com. There's a link in the top menu bar where you can do that. At the end of the show, if you'll stick around, we're going to have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Essence, Book 1, Septima, the first volume in the exciting new science fiction series by Nick Breaker. Troy is no longer himself. Kidnapped by aliens, infected with the essence of the dead General Tomas, Troy grasps at his only hope of survival. He merges his soul with the alien parasite trying to possess him, leaving him forever changed, and not entirely for the worse. Once plagued by crippling phobias, Troy is now fearless, willing to fight his enemies with his bare hands. But with his new strength also comes a new weakness, women. Tomas was notorious for his insatiable desires, and Troy finds himself constantly resisting temptation, especially the gorgeous, manipulative Alta. Although Alta has convinced the Pyrrhans she's helping them prepare to battle the murderous Reptarans, she's actually meticulously planning to steal their ultimate power source and then abandon them to their fate. Alta won't hesitate to kill anyone in her way, and her deep love for Tomas is Troy's only advantage. He convinces Alta that Tomas has taken full control of his being and thus keeps her trust and his life. While Alta schemes, Troy covertly struggles to save the Pyrrhans and prevent the Reptorans from invading Earth. But first, he must wrest back control of his own soul. Essence, Book 1, Septima, the first volume in the exciting new science fiction series by Nick Breaker. Find it on Amazon today. There's a link in the show notes. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, I'm really excited to have my friend Eamon Ambrose back on the show with me. Uh, Eamon, uh, let's see, I think you were like episode 77, if I'm... If I remember right, do you remember by any yeah, chance? Yeah, yeah, I think it was 77. Yeah, so yeah, that's, we've, we've needed to catch up for a while then. Uh, it's, uh, a, a lot of you probably know Eamon from his book, Zero Hour, and uh, he had this phenomenally uh, intriguing and, uh, and really exciting and uh, really successful uh, serialized uh, story that, uh, that was doing awesome things and then uh, also collected those into an omnibus edition. Uh, and uh, still one of my favorite things, uh, Eamon, I love that you really turned uh, the narrative on its head and you, you brought uh, a, a way of storytelling that is so hard to pull off. And, uh, but it, it really, really worked. Um, so anyway, uh, welcome back to the show and uh, how Thank are you? you? Great, fantastic! Uh, it's great to be back. Yeah. So, uh, so what's been going on with you these uh, last couple of years since we uh, since we got a chance to hang out? Well, the basically the, the one of the, the things I wanted to do um, once I was finished with the whole zero hour thing um, was that um, I kind of wanted to just take a little bit of a step back because the problem with what happened with zero hour is that it happened very quickly for me as a writer. So I really. It, it was kind of one of those still written. Um, so I kind of wanted to take a little, little step back and do a little more work on, on learning the craft as such before I did anything major, novel-wise, after that. Um, so basically what I've been doing for the last year or so um, is working on some short stories, just basically trying to hone my, hone my skills a little bit more. Um, 
I mean, it's probably a fluke that Zero Hour worked as well as it did, you know, from a writing point of view, because I was a complete novice. So um, I, I kind of wanted to, to have a little more skill before I went to do anything more significant again. Um, but having said that, I had some great fun writing writing the shorts. Um, and I, I, th- I think I wrote some really great stories over the last year or so. And it's it's been really fun, and I've I've learned a lot from it as well. So that was kind of my the main thing. I um, I also did we also did a little bit of work on on the audiobook for for Zero Hour, which is great, um, which turned out really well. And um, I did some other stuff, some um, some festivals, some writing festivals where I did some um, seminars and stuff like that. And I, I got to talk to people, and it was it was really good. And uh, I got to to do some present seminars myself on, on some self-publishing stuff uh, and just to talk to people about that which is really good and it's a great experience and and also kind of meeting other other writers in in ireland uh, trad and self-published which is which, which was brilliant and i made some great friends from uh, so uh, some book clubs that i'm in and stuff like that so i also did a lot more reading um i i spent a lot of time reading in the last year not just sci-fi i've kind of i wanted to kind of branch out and diversify and, and, and read other genres uh some, some literary fiction some crime fiction uh you know just just something different for a change so yeah i've been i've been busy sort of just making myself a better writer over the last 12 months 16 months as well yeah i i've done a lot of the same things Eamon. um the uh well you know as someone who who uh typically writes uh sci-fi or uh kind of urban fantasy or you know kind of um um yeah, weird stuff uh you know it's it does it does a body good uh to read sometimes way outside your genre uh yeah. to to just kind of pick apart how other people do it and uh i think it it really helps you to stand out more in your own genre uh when you you know, start picking up some other elements of style and, uh, and, you know, otherwise we just become cookie cutters of each other. And uh, I think it's, it's, uh, I always tell people, and that's one reason that I try to have such a, uh, a diversity of guests on the show from all sorts of genres, because, uh, I'm of the opinion that, uh, that I'm not too proud to learn from anyone. And, yeah. uh, I, there, there's, uh, I, I always approach, uh, as a student, and uh, there, there's always something I can learn. I I may not be a big fan of what they do, but there's something I can learn from them. And uh, I, I think all writers uh, need to have a, a time like that. Uh, so I I think that's awesome. I, I love that. Uh, let's give people a little refresher. Uh, you began as a blogger, uh, and yeah. and was reviewing um, uh, quite a lot. And what was that initial motivation to write Zero Hour? Um, I, when I started doing the blog, um, I sort of fell into reading a lot of indie indie published books, uh, starting with with Hugh Hobby's Wool, and kind of it, it kind of snowballed from there. And I met I met I, I read a lot of indie books, and I I, I spoke to a lot of, of indie authors, and I kind of just got very interested in in the whole side of the business and how it works and how the, how it was working and how they were selling books and how you know all the you know the work that they were putting in and, and the, the sort of community spirit that was there um and from that um i, I had t- i'd been i'd been toying with writing for a while um so i i kind of just decided to to write some shorts and um my initial plan was to to write sort of five or six shorts and then maybe if they did well, just publish them together afterwards. Um, so the Zero Hour was the first one I, I, I'd actually written. And the it kind of snowballed from there. Once they released that, it, it just kind of got wings of its own and, and took off. And uh, from there, I, I, it, I had never planned on, on, on continuing the story from that, as I said before. But it... it I had got so many, so many, so much contact from people, and so many, I got so many emails and people cont- contacted me asking, well, what, "What happens next?" And I said, "Oh, I don't know what happens next, so <laughs> <laughs> I better find out." So, so basically, I, I, I sat down and I, I just, 
I just literally continued on from where let, where that story finished because it, it was a little open ended, like most short stories are. But um, I had I, I, it wasn't done deliberately to to sort of so I could extend it later. Um, but um, the, the whole thing just sort of blossomed from there, and it continued on into the into the six parts and and the full book eventually. Um, and I think um, there's there's been a lot of a lot of questions lately about what happens again after that. Um, so there may be something else in the in the pipeline there as well. So I'm, I'm just trying to throw logistics stuff at the moment, but we may we may go back into that universe again at some stage, hopefully. Well, if if I remember right, the last time we talked, uh, the zero hour was not finished. You had not released all six of the pieces yet, or I, at least yeah. you you had not published the omnibus. I know um, by that time, and uh, I I really find it interesting because um, I, I love writing short stories as well. And one of the things I love about it, uh, well, there there's several things that I really love about it. One is that um, you know you can kind of be in and out. In uh, in a shorter amount of time, sometimes a few days, yeah. sometimes a few weeks, um, but you know you can really wrap your your mind around the whole thing generally, and and hold it all uh, together as you write it, uh, and and I love that. The other thing is I love to leave them a little open ended, and and you mentioned that, um, and sometimes that lends itself to continue the story, uh, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the story just yeah. needs to be open ended. Um, because, and I've said this a lot because I like to walk around for a few days with the ending of that story kind of rolling around in my head and, and me, uh, kind of wondering what happens to him. And I, I like that feeling. Um, I think, I think I, it happens, especially in sci-fi, it happens, it happens a lot. Yes. I think with sort of, when you, when you go into the sort of more literary short stories, it, it, they, while the, a lot of literary short stories aren't really linear, uh, some of them, you know, it, 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 some of them might be very short, uh, very sort of a, the prose might be slightly different on, but the endings, it doesn't have the same sort of twist ending that a lot of, that a lot of short stories have uh, in sci-fi. And it, it also, it they, with sci-fi short stories as well, there's always sort of a, a hint there that, you know, there may be some continuation. I think if it just, it, they, it, I think when you look at certain short stories like, um, Say um, the one that was used for what was it? Arrival. Right. Yes. The, um, it was, I can't remember the name of the short story that was used for that. But uh, you know, it's when you see stories like that, they're sort of self-contained. Um, I think with sci-fi short stories, what I'm trying to say is that they they tend to be sort of self-contained little bubbles, whereas they tend to be very linear, start end finish. Uh, and sometimes if they're open ended, it can be sort of a, it, there is a doorway there to go back to if you want to. But it's not not always necessary, like you say. Right. Uh, that short story was called Story of Your Life. Uh, uh, yeah. I believe it was. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, it, it's really interesting that a lot of movies are uh, well, and more so now, I, I think some movie studios are really uh, digging kind of into the body of a published work that's out there and uh, short stories generally are, are perfectly suited for film, uh, mm. you know, and, and maybe now that we have uh, the technology to make long form TV and make it well, um, you know, then the novels get broken out into things like that. Uh, but uh, we're, we're really at a great time for stuff like that. Yeah. I think the, um, an interesting one there is that even even sort of shorter novels, novellas and stuff are getting are also getting made into movies and, and even even TV series. Um, I was just watching yesterday on the news the George R. R. Martin's uh, Night Flyers is being filmed. It's actually being filmed just down the road here for me the, in the new studio complex that they've built, and uh, they, they just they just dropped the trailer for that last night. It, look, it looks fantastic, but it's it, it was eventually it, it was originally just a very short novella. But again, you can see, you know, it's been it's been extended into a series as well. How cool is that? Yeah. Um, what do you what do you think you learned, uh, Eamon, from from that original short story and then carrying it out to six uh, episodes, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. that that comprised a full story? Um, what do you and I know that you began uh, because you just wanted to write a short and you wanted to begin 
uh, this process. And then at the end, you, you wound up with something that, that I'm assuming you never imagined that it would be. <laughs> um, what do you think you learned along that journey that, uh, that you carry with you now? Uh, when, when you begin a new project, maybe um, having that knowledge now? Um, I, a couple of things. I think you learn a lot about um, plot, about where, you know, uh, I think I, I did a I did a, a, an article on it a while back uh, on a, a blog post. And uh, I also, it helps you to remember where you parked. <laughs> because uh, when, you, when you're writing, when you're writing a, a sort of something like that, um, it's it's very easy to forget um, because you're doing because I was writing it as well because I was I was pantsing it I wasn't um, I wasn't I hadn't written out a specific uh, plot for for the story um, I had a kind of very vague ending in mind um, so I I was basically writing it as as I, as I went um, so that's great because it's very easy to write yourself into a corner and the problem with doing that the way I did it especially with Syria. If you do just get into a corner, you you can't go back because the previous are already out. <laughs> <Yes>. So, uh, <laughs> so so it's kind of dangerous, but at the same time, it's kind of you know it kind of keeps you you know it keeps you motivated and it keeps you kind of fresh you know it keeps you fresh. So I think it, in one way it helped, in other way in other ways it, it, you know, it could have gone horribly wrong. Um, but but it's but, yeah, also, think, it's also kind of visceral that that you're you're in the thick of it and yeah. you, you have to write your way out of this. Yeah, and I, there's I, no I think, other solution. Yeah, I think, and that's the way, and that's the way the story is actually written as well. So that's, and it's for that reason I wanted to keep it that way. I think I could have sort of, kind of continued from from part one. I could have continued like as a normal narrative, but I, I kind of felt that it it lost the, the the sheen of the first part if I'd done that. So I think um, because it, I, I wrote it in the same in the same tense in the same fashion in the same sort of pacing. Um, it, it it worked out really well that way. Um, whereas if I if I had changed, I don't know if it would have. So and it, because I wanted to keep it visceral like that, you know, I think that really helped with the narrative as well. And and you felt because the story was was meant to make you feel like you, you know you're on the edge of your seat. That's literally how I was when I was writing it because I was I was literally trying to figure out frantically trying to figure out what happens next and uh, i think it, it kept that sort of translated into the narrative as well which was really nice um speaking of the narrative one of the things that was so inventive about zero hour and you you seldom see it and uh i think you seldom see it because it's so hard to do uh was the the second person uh narrative uh, yeah what, what was your your idea for that and did you ever get to a point in the writing where you said, "Oh God, I wish I would not have done this"? <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think probably around the, I, I, I can, I did change it slightly for I think it was the third or fourth part uh, where I kind of when it went to a different character's perspective, but I, then it went back to it again. Uh, so there was a brief, a brief stay from it, but yeah, I mean, I think around towards the middle of the story, I was wondering, you know, is this going to hold people's attention? It, you know, is are people going to want to keep reading this if I keep this tense up? Uh, I, which is why I did do a slight change. I think it was, I think it was the fourth part I changed it on, um, and then went back to it again for the the final two. Um, so yeah, I did. I, I did wonder if it was going to keep keep the momentum going, uh, but but thankfully it did. I think. Did you ever find yourself uh, in the midst of writing, uh, breaking perspective and having to? To go back and oh, I've, I've got to go change this. I accidentally <laughs> slipped into third person, or you know, yeah, or yeah, I, I, constantly. Um, it, it's just it, it was very easy because you know, um, it's very easy to to fall back into it again. Um, but but having said that, I hadn't written a whole lot beforehand, so this was my first writing, one of my early writing experiences. So uh, I didn't have too many bad habits to fall back into at that point. So right, and and you also don't know the rules uh, that you're that you're breaking or, or, you know, yeah. that, uh, and, and that's a beautiful thing, you know, because, uh, sometimes yeah. we, um, we get so deep into the, how it's supposed to work that we don't look for an innovative way to yeah. shake things up, you know? So. Yeah. You see that a lot. I mean, you see that a lot of music as well. I mean, right. if, you, if, you, if you listen to REM, they're not particularly great musicians, but because they experimented and because they, you know, they just kind of picked up guitars and just messed around until they found something, kind of sound that sounded really odd and different and you know right. it, 
you know, it, it, and that's how it works. I mean, it doesn't always work, obviously, but you know, with, with our, you know, you hear bands like you know, MCD Sound System, or you know, they they're just innovative, but they sound like they're really professional. But a lot of times they're just pantsing and they're just <laughs> twiddling knobs and seeing what happens. Right. Uh, you know, they're just pressing a button and throwing something here and changing something and chopping something over and. It, it, I, I, I've been a musician as well, so I've, I've done that too. But I think it, it, re, it, it, sometimes it's really nice to work like that because you get something completely fresh and something different. And I think that's partly what I tried to do with, with Zero Hour as well. I, I kind of wanted to sort of break the mold a little bit and, and not fall into the same traps that everybody else did. So, but whether I can, whether I can continue that with my other work, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. You know. You can't do it all the time either. I mean, you can't if you you can't constantly do it that way either. I think, you know, it's it's nice to do it every now and again, but sometimes you just you need to kind of rein yourself back a little bit as well. Right, right, and and sometimes you just need to pick up a Rickenbacker and plug it into a Vox amp and put a lot of uh, reverb on it and like REM and and create something brand new. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you said that you, after you finished that, that you wanted to take some time and really work on the craft. Uh, what's, what things specifically, um, did you maybe notice in your own work or maybe you were looking to the future at some things that you wanted to tackle and you wanted better tools in your toolkit? Maybe, um, what were some of the things you were looking for, uh, as a writer to enhance your writing experience? I think, um, uh, a lot of it was just I wanted to sort of experience some other genres because the problem the problem with what I was doing was that I'd spend a couple of years uh, reviewing science fiction, so I'd basically spend a couple of years a couple of years reading nothing else but science fiction uh, before I started writing. Now it was a great it was a great primer for being a science fiction writer. Um, it was, and the but at the same time, uh, as because I'd only written, you know, a, a, a very small amount of work, um, I think it was important to sort of turn around and, and then start looking at some other, some other genres and some other, some other uh, writers and stuff I've never read before. So, you know, stuff I wouldn't normally read. I think what helped out that as well was I'd started getting into audiobooks. Um, so, when you're reading audiobooks or listening to them, whatever, there's a bit of an argument over what, which, whether it's actually reading or not. Um, but um, the great thing about audiobooks, especially if you get an Audible account, is that you don't always rush in and buy the, you know, the exact book that you want to read. So you get recommendations or you'll see the daily deals and you'll just see something that you'd, you'd never normally read, but you'd buy it because it's two ninety nine or something. Um, and I, that happened an awful lot with me. You know, I'd read, you know, read stuff like Graham Greene and um, Kate Atkinson and stuff like that, which I hadn't, you know, I wouldn't normally have, have gotten a chance to read even. Um, and so, you know, and there was some even Gabriel Garcia Marquez, stuff like that, that I, it was just wonderful to just go through all these different genres during the year. And, and audiobooks have a great capacity for that for me. I find it, sometimes I find it really hard to, to concentrate when I'm reading print. So audiobooks are brilliant for me. Uh, and it was great to see my own audio book out there as well. But yeah, I mean, from, from a point of view of, of, of learning and, and, and getting the craft, that was the, the biggest thing for me was just reading more and reading better. Um, and I've, I've sort of come full circle with it now, whereas I kind of want to go back into it now, into, into reading my own genre again for a while and, and, and to see what's, what's come around since that. Um, there's, a, there's been a lot of, um, upheaval really in the in the in the whole indie writing community in the last year or so i think um and it, it it's but even even in the uh, regular sci-fi and traditional sci-fi um the, there's been a lot of changes in, in the industry over the last year or so um it's it's interesting to see what's coming out now um it's 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 very different here in ireland um, so, it, it, but it, most, most of my mark is in the States at the moment. So I kind of concentrate on what's going on there. Well, speaking of Ireland, um, do you, do you feel like, and, and, and you write a lot of, uh, sci-fi and, and futuristic sci-fi. Um, but I'm always intrigued by how, uh, a, a person's place and, and where they're from, uh, leaks into their writing. Uh, do you feel like, 
uh, Ireland uh, leaks into your writing in any way or uh, kind of, I, I know you, you live in the, the Limerick countryside uh, and, and you write futuristic sci-fi and uh, you know, I live uh, in the, in the Mississippi countryside and I write, you know, weird stories about, uh, you know, crazy places. And so um, even if they don't, if they aren't directly representative, do, do you feel like Ireland comes out in your writing? I um, Probably not as much as I'd like to, um, but I think it, it, it probably comes out a lot in, in my characters and in, in dialogue and stuff like that. I think, you know, the, the sort of the humor and the, the snarkiness and, and stuff like that might, you know, that will sort of, that will come out all right. Uh, I, I, I don't write, uh, I, I will, up to now I haven't really, haven't any story set in Ireland. Um, and, the, and the main reason for that is because growing up, uh, you know, watching sci-fi or reading sci-fi, there was, there was literally no Irish work there so i grew up watching american tv i grew up watching american sci-fi movies or british sci-fi movies um so that's what i was raised on uh so there is no sort of huge irish sci-fi community there are some doing it but it's it's very it's very close-knit and uh and again i don't really sell a whole lot of books here anyway so but i i do still kind of like to keep in touch with other writers and and there are there. Are, I have, I've met some brilliant writers over the last couple of years here, um, and you, you know it, people are really doing hard work and, and and pushing themselves, and especially some of the newer newer younger writers. Um, and so there there is a there is a, a certain Irishness to those as well. Um, I, I think one of the the best one one of the best writers I've seen to sort of do a genre thing and keep it keep it an Irish flavor to it was probably Dave Rudden. I was uh, about who to you had on the way back, yeah. Yeah, I was about to say that that uh, when you said your your characters uh, have a, a certain Irishness about them in their attitude and their uh, the snarkiness. Uh, Dave and I talked about that, and and he talked about the little pub you know down the road from his from his house and <laughs> yeah. and how those characters come out. And uh, I I just laughed. And when you were saying that, he Dave was was the person that came to my mind and thank you for introducing me to him. Uh, what a yeah. tremendous talent he is. Yeah. He's unbelievable. He's, he's uh, Dave's a complete trooper. And he, he, he does, uh, even though he's signed to, you know, even though he, he's, he's tried published the amount of work he does for himself on top of that, as in, you know, doing gigs and what he, he does. He, he did a couple of hundred gigs last year going around to schools himself on his own back. And so he just pushes himself and pushes himself. And he's, he's always out there and he's, 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 I'd love to be like him. I'd love yeah. to have his energy. Well, he's um, a, and he's a sweetheart he, of a guy on top. He's, he's great. Just, he's great. Yeah. Uh, we, we got together there at Christmas. Um, we, we, there's a, a book club that, that I'm in, uh, and they, it's one of the, the country's biggest ones, but they, every year they have a Christmas party where they invite the authors, uh, all of their authors that are in the club and some readers to the party. So we do that once a year and it's, it, it, we usually meet up around then. So it's, it's a brilliant night out for us and it's, it's great to sort of get around and talk to, you know, the people around because a lot of the writers here will be based in Dublin. So, you know, there aren't a whole lot in the local area that I can talk to really, but, um, it's great to get out for a night and you know to get together and see the, the talent that's out there. It's, it, there. There is a lot of really good upcoming talent here at the minute. Well, and and you mentioned that uh, that Dave is is uh, traditionally published and uh, but but still does a lot of his own work. You know that is that is a common thread uh, these days. No matter uh, where when I talk to authors, no matter where they're from uh, yeah. in the in the publishing landscape. Uh, that that's the reality now is that that writers, uh, if you're not working for yourself in in publicity and um, and uh, networking and and just doing all of the things that indie publishers are doing, if you're a tradition, you know, unless you're uh, you know uh, Anne Rice or, or uh, John Grisham or you know that that handful of people, um, yeah. that you're just you know the the publisher's not working for you, so you, you better be out doing it for yourself and. Um, you know, which which is a, a great time. I, I think the the playing field is, field is more level than it's ever been. Yeah, I think the 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 the, the trad community, you know, the trad publishers are they're looking at uh, well, they have been for a while, but you know, they're looking at how 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 indie publishers work, and they they 
they're sort of taken on board now. I think a lot of the things that we do, I mean, most of them now are using things like BookBub and, you know, most of them are, are looking at contracts now in a different way. There's a lot of new sort of um, imprints from the major publishers who are, who are starting to do things kind of differently and they're, they're given better deals. They're given smaller advances. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're doing digital only stuff. Um, and it's, this is, you know, there's a couple of them that they're doing really well and the, the authors are doing really well. And it's, it's nice to see that. Um, I think it's, there's going to be a big change, I think in the next couple of years, because the, the indie publishing has gotten so hard now that it's, you know, I see even some of the big names struggling. Um, so it's 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 going to be interesting to see what happens over the next year or two. I mean, I mean, I'm this for for the long run. Like I keep my I keep my overheads low, so I don't really need to spend a whole lot of money on 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 sending stuff out or releasing stuff. So, but I can see a big change happening, um, and I I think ideally, I mean the the. For, for any writer, a bit of stability is is always a good thing. And if 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 it comes to a point where publishers start of start looking at indie authors and offering them sort of better deals than you know they were offering previously, um, I think they you know there could be a happy medium there. Um, so yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next year or two. I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, you've got a, a new release out now called Love and Other Algorithms. Uh, before we talk about that too much, tell me about your other Inokyo Rising. Um, yeah. Both of these stories are, are interesting uh, because they're, they're they're both based around robots and kind of AI that has gone, uh, I, I don't want to say too far, but but farther than we are now. Uh, <laughs> what what is your What is your love and fascination with robots and AI? I'm not sure actually. It's it's um I I tried to sort of move away from it a little bit. I even did a horror story during the year. Um but it, it the the um I'm I'm always interested in AI because where AI is going it could go any number of ways. And some of them could be really interesting, some of them are really scary. Um and I've been I've been sort of studying it a little bit. Um there's it, I think I'm part of of, um, of Nokia Rising is that um, what happens if you know if if you kind of abuse AI and I, I, I kind of touched on that in zero as well is you know if if you create an AI, an AI and start to abuse it, um, which could easily happen and you know given human nature, um, and that was kind of this, that that was kind of the, the mainstay of that is, and and. The, the robots sort of <laughs> wanting to not wanting to rebel, but just to be left alone and sort of he just wanted to get on with things himself. Um, but I think it's a little bit Nokia Rising is a little bit tongue in cheek as well. It's, it's it was me having a lot, a lot of fun uh, because I hadn't done anything in a while. It was the kind of the first thing I'd done since Zero Hour, and um, I kind of wanted to have it, it to be funny and, and have it a little bit of it was still dark but it was you know it, it, it was me just having a bit of fun um but it's a good it's, I, I, it's a story i really i'm really proud of i think it's really it, it, it's really sort of it, even though it's fun it's it, it's got an interesting take on, on on the whole ai genre well it's uh it it, it does kind of have a dark turn but but it's uh it's a lot of fun i mean the premise is fun to begin with and so even though it it does you know go to uh, well, well, let's just tell people what it's about. You, you've got a, a, a robot who uh, wants to escape uh, his his lot in life, uh, yeah. basically. Um, and uh, where do you uh, – what happens – without giving away the ending, but what happens to uh, uh, to Nokio and, 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 uh, and the, the circumstances that are set into motion? Yeah, I mean, basically what he needs to do is, is he needs to transfer – himself into into somebody's body and he because he works for a, a large kind of he, he just works as a sort of maintenance robot but because he works as he works for a really large company he the, the thing about the the initial story with him is that he was sort of implanted with a special ai he's not just an off-the-shelf robot so the he was the rom that was implanted with his ai 
was sort of done more as an experiment and it was, it was kind of subversive and he ends up being very <laughs> subversive. So he's speaking he, of, of, of Irish. Yeah. They, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's part of that. Yeah, definitely. There, there right. is a lot of Irish in that story. Uh, and he, he turns around, but he, he, he ultimately, uh, what also happens there is that he starts sort of, uh, he ends up um, creating a sort of vicious circle in that when he when he does um, eventually escape, it's up to whoever is left behind to do the same if they want to. So it 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 there's an interesting sort of loop there at the end. Awesome. Um, was that story part of an anthology first, or was this written uh, strictly no, was, as a standalone? Yeah, it was actually it was written for the. Um, the it was supposed to be on the Sam Sam Peralta's um, illustrated robot uh, anthology, which was postponed and, and ultimately cancelled but because Sam is very sadly sort of um, decided to, to, to stop publishing for now but um, I've actually I've, from what I know I think um, Patrice Fitzgerald may be going to publish it um, so I'm not sure what's happening with it yet I, if it will be on the, on the new the new version or not because, I, because I've because i already published it but I, I, I'd be delighted if it was um, but I have to speak to, I haven't spoken to anybody about it yet so hopefully it will be in the, the, new, the, new, the, the new release I know Patrice has picked up some of those and I, I really hope she does I, I, I love her to death I, I think she yeah, would do she, fantastic we actually, things and... we actually she actually uh, came to see me um, during the summer Oh, cool. So it was great. Nice. It was great. Great to meet her, and we she came out to my house and we had dinner and stuff like that. And oh, how cool! Really interesting. So it was, that was fantastic. So it's great. It's great to meet, finally meet people after all these years as well, which is which is brilliant. So uh, so that brings us to love and other algorithms. Tell us about Frank uh, and uh, and and what is going on with him. Yeah. Um, the, the, again, the premise I kind of touched on this was in zero, hour, uh, but I kind of wanted to go into it in more detail. Um, with with, with zero, hour, uh, love and other algorithms is basically a, a love story between two robots. Because what normally happens is that with a lot of movies and a lot of short stories and, and sci-fi, it always tends to be sort of a human falling in love with a robot or a robot falling in love with a human, um, usually with dark consequences. And uh, but I I wanted to kind of say well okay well if you if you programmed AI so advanced that um, they can actually have relationships together what would happen there? Um, now it's still a basic a basic story but it it does kind of have some twists and turns and it, it there are some sort of um, revelations towards the end um, but it's basically a story of of of, of two robots meeting and, and how far they go to sort of stay together. Um, but it's, it's also a good sort of a, an action part. You know, there, there is a good action part in it and the, the, it does have a, a, a I think, a, a nice ending to it. But um, again, it, it's one of those stories that a couple of people have read and go, well, what happens next? And like, oh, no, don't do this to me. <laughs> oh, no. So, I should have killed everyone at the end yeah. of the story. Yeah. yeah. I need to stop doing that, really. <laughs> well, you know, one of the, the great things about uh, science fiction and speculative fiction is uh, it lets us take things that we see in our present world and kind of run them out uh, to to see how things might play out. And uh, I think it's science fiction especially uh, allows us to have great uh, thought experiments and thought exercises um, to to maybe check ourselves and see if we're going down a path. Um, that is maybe destructive. And uh, I think too many times people look at uh, speculative fiction and instead of looking at them as cautionary tales, they look at them as how-to manuals and we wind <laughs> up with the world that we're living in now. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but you know, there, there's there's uh, the rise of, uh, how shall we say, uh, personal relationship robots uh, that are uh, kind of becoming a thing now. They're you can't read the news on any given day without some story about some, you know, brothel that's now staffed with only robots and crazy <laughs> stuff like that. Um, do, were, you, were you thinking about anything like that in writing the story or um, uh, were you just thinking about AI and relationships? Uh, yeah, no, I've, I've, have... I've been sort of watching, sort of, I, 
I mean, part of it is AI, the other part of it is robotics. And I think I've been watching sort of how both are, are advancing and, and they're both advancing in a phenomenal pace. And um, if you look at some of the newer um, sort of humanoid size, you know, type robots that are on the, that are, that are being created right now, they're just, just amazing. Um, and on top of that, the, the AI is exponentially growing. So it's, you know, once they sort of manage to fuse them together perfectly, which I'm sure will happen at some point, um, you know, you have to wonder what's going to happen. Um, and, and there are, you know, there are people sort of, even people like Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, who are sort of warning against it. Um, other uh, other people then are sort of say, well, wait, wait, we can control what happens here. Um, and again, that's part of what I write about a lot is that, you know, sometimes you can't control it. Sometimes the, the thing about algorithms, uh, and that this was part of the story, is that uh, with algorithms, a lot of things, the computer can make a decision, an AI can make a decision and not know why it's made it. Um, and that's kind of everything. So, and, and that's a lot of what I write about. Um, but I, I, ultimately, I like to be a little bit positive about it, though. I, I don't want to be too fatalistic and too down people. But I, I mean, I'd like to think that, you know, it'll work out well. I'd like to think so, too. You know, I mean, I, uh, and, and the thing about Zero, it wasn't, the, you know, it wasn't the robots or the AI that, that did the damage. It was a human. So exactly. he, just used, exactly. he just used the AI to do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sometimes I worry about our, our dependence on technology and, and especially uh, algorithms and things growing too smart for their own good. Uh, yeah. At the same time, I would not want to live a hundred years ago and die from an infection from a rusty ax or something, you know? So uh, okay. I'm, I, I, I love that we live in the future. And uh, so, yeah. Anyway. yeah. I mean, I, and when you look at, when you look at things like uh, robotics or even sort of, prosthetics and stuff like that I, I was looking at some stuff today some guys just low-cost 3d printed prosthetics that work perfectly you know and you see things like that and they're just amazing and then but then again you know you see other stuff like people messing around with bitcoin and people you know you know it, it, some stuff is just you know you just want to say look just stop and other stuff you say please do more and then, and it, i think people just need to concentrate on doing the good stuff and forget about the silly stuff well, I, I think you you nailed it on the head. Uh, talking about zero hour, is that uh, these things are an amplification of our human nature. Yeah. Um, the the things that we're really good at and and that we do for the good of humanity, those things get amplified. Uh, but then the 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 idiots get amplified as well. And uh, you know, it's it, it, it's just it's just uh, you know, it's just uh, human nature on a on a on a bigger stage. Absolutely. So I, I think. You know, if if we keep uh, magnifying the good, then I think we're going to be okay. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, so I, I know you're working on something else that's going to be out uh, in a couple of months. Uh, is that Madeline Strange? Yeah, um, we, yeah. It's been a while, and it, the, I kind of I started that um, before I, I released Zero. Hour. I was um, kind of about a third of the way into it, and. Um, it's been in my head since uh, it's never gone. It's always been there, but it's just so much happened with zero hour. And I also wanted to sort of spend a bit more, more time, like I say, practicing the craft before I went back to it. So I'm, I'm ready to go. Uh, I'm literally sitting down tomorrow to start the rest of that. And I'm, I'm hoping to get it finished in the next couple of months. And get, um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it as far as releasing it. Concerned. It'll, it'll be a full novel. So, We'll see what happens. Um, if there's interest from anybody, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take it into account. Um, I've, I've had a few people curious about it already, so we'll see what happens. But, I, you know, I have no plans for now other than just, just to get it finished and then we'll see what happens. But it, 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 it's, again, it's, it's, it's a big, it's a bit of a departure. It's going to be more of a sort of a modern fantasy uh I don't like to use I don't like to use the word urban fancy because it's not really an urban story, but it, it, right. it's more horror kind of. It, it, it's but it's not it's not sort of hardcore horror if you if you get me. It's more of a, a more paranormal. Thriller. Yeah, yeah, but sort of a paranormal paranormal thriller, I suppose, would be the best thing. Gotcha. Well, I can't wait to see what your take on the genre will be. Uh, I know it's going to be fantastic. Um, 
Uh, Eamon, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, where can everybody find you online? Uh, I, I know you've got uh, several things on your website for people to go uh, pick up and buy. Um, uh, your website is AeamonAmbrose.com, is that right? Yeah, you can, get, you, right. you can get all my links there. You can get the links to my to my social media and stuff like that. I'm on Twitter and on Facebook for now. And we'll, <laughs> we'll see what's happening with Facebook at the moment. So. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, for now, I'll, I'll be st- I'll, I'll stay there because it basically it's where it's where most of my readers are. So I don't want right. to ab- abandon them unless they are abandoning me first. So we'll, we'll wait and see. Sure. Um, sure. But yeah, uh, but I'm on Twitter as well um, or Instagram or you, the links are all on my on my webpage anyway, so you'll find them there. And the newest release is called Love and Other Algorithms. Uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, Eamon, thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show with me. It's great to be back. Thank you, Hank. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Jason and Joey took their food trays outside and sat high above the parking lot on the secluded stairwell that had become their lunchtime hangout, picking at their Thanksgiving specials and swapping updates. They were almost finished eating before Jason managed to screw up the courage to say what he needed to. I want to apologize. Joey looked puzzled. What the hell for? Because your coma was my fault. Yours? The horseman beamed me. You didn't. Hey, want to see something cool? Look what I found on my phone. Joey produced the device, hit a few buttons, and swiped his finger. An orange circle hung in a field of black, overexposed, something that had been moving fast when the flash caught it. I was trying to get his picture, right? Like an idiot? Well, I didn't get him, but that is the pumpkin he threw at me. Jason stared at the blurry orange shape for a long time. Cool. Cool? Can you imagine if we actually got a picture of the headless horseman? We'd be famous by now. He pocketed the phone. Hey, do you want the rest of this turkey? It looks like bologna. Tastes like bologna, too. He speared the slice anyway. Look, this is going to sound weird, but I think I made you a target. What do you mean? I made you a target by by telling you about my gift. It's some sort of magical rule. If we reveal ourselves to a normal person, whoever we tell becomes a target for ghosts. And usually, they die. And you told me anyway? No, I'd already told you. There was no way to untell you. Don't be mad. It all worked out, right? Right? Joey's expression had darkened. Give me a second here. And there's a bright side. What bright side? Now you'll have a gift too. Me? That's what your coma was. Some kind of transition. You got targeted, but you survived. You'll be a founder now. Like Ichabod. You'll pass your gift to your kids like he passed his to me. Joey looked worried. What kind of gift will I get? People get gifts that complement their natural abilities. It could be anything. Anything? So, I could read minds? I guess. Turn purple and levitate? Probably not. Something that expresses the essential you. Then I'll have an actor's gift. I want... What's an actor's gift? Jason shrugged. Super narcissism? Shut up. So you're not mad? Joey was shaking with excitement. Mad? This is the coolest thing ever! We'll be like the dynamic duo, fighting supernatural foes up and down the eastern seaboard. Jason laughed, feeling epic relief. I thought you'd be pissed. Nah... What's a little coma between friends? He took a bite out of a nutter butter, grinning madly. I'm going to be a superhero. But you can't tell anyone. Why not? Weren't you listening? Everyone we tell dies. You can't talk about your gift to anybody. But if they were targeted and lived, we could have our own X-Men. Yeah, or all your friends could die. Do you want to risk that? No, I guess not. But I don't do closets very well, you know? I came out at conception. Promise to keep it to yourself. 
Yeah, yeah. Joey shifted sideways and walked his sneakers up the brick. So, the essential me. Ooh, I know what gift I'll get. I'll get a singer's gift. What's a singer's gift? Jason shrugged. Superhuman drug tolerance? Shut up! <laughs>